Why are we here this evening, somebody asks. The accounts that will be related to you this evening paint a picture of a state Republican hierarchy's behavior that mirrors, mirrors Lord Acton's admonition that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Consequently, the answer to why we are here is quite simply to expose political chicanery, to educate, to motivate, to activate, and to begin the restoration of integrity, honesty, and transparency back into the leadership of our state Republican hierarchy. Additionally, we are here to emphatically announce that our conservative ideals and principles are here to stay, and that we won't be intimidated, bullied over, modulized, or concede our values no matter what forces are brought to bear. This will not be This will not be an easy or short road to travel, but a necessary journey that must be taken if we wish to once again restore our state party's guiding principles back to those of our founder and first Republican, Abraham Lincoln. To quote Ronald Reagan, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our, belief, our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. Our first speaker this evening is going to be Dave Kopas, who is president of MARA. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening. I'm starting already. <laughs> uh, I didn't come up here with a, a script of any kind, and uh, it could be a rarity for me to do such things, as I uh, really do like to speak from the heart. And I think a lot of the people out there are tired of being spoken to from a script. Um, it often leads nowhere for us. So, um, myself, I'm really just an angry country boy. Um, I often speak, and for those of you who have uh, heard this before, I apologize for being redundant, but uh, it's simply part of my story, is uh, I had an extremely close relationship with my grandparents. Um, my grandfather was a, a Republican, my grandmother a Democrat, and that was the trend in, in the family, the men were Republican and women were Democrats. And by way of comparison, my grandmother, the Democrat, is probably more conservative than our state leadership is today. <laughs> they were very family oriented. That was the take home message. I didn't know about the, the, the Democrat Republican thing until uh, I was uh, a lot older. But the, the appeal with my grandparents was that they were family oriented. They knew the importance of a good, solid, nurturing family. Something that is almost extinct in this state, in this country right now. Parents don't sit down at the table with their children and talk and eat anymore. They, uh, that closeness isn't there. Things aren't passed down from one generation to the next. And for many, many years, because I didn't know what to do, I, with my family being split like that, I wound up being unenrolled for a long time. And when I started to see what was going on in the political environment around me, um, I realized why there were so many other people on and wall. It just seemed that the two parties no longer were representing their constituents. And being from a small town, and really being small government at my roots, uh, I eventually, as I looked at the political landscape around me and gained a better understanding of how it works procedurally, the rules and the bylaws associated with it. And then I looked at the national landscape, and the, to me, it was an obvious choice that I needed to register a Republican and fight for those values that were the principles, the core principles of the Republican Party, um, what few that were left remaining, and those that have seemed to be pushed by the wayside needed to be defended. And I registered as a Republican. And uh, I'm, to this day, I'm committed, and I will never re-register as anything else. And I, I got even more involved. I started uh, you know, hanging around Canada's campaign, seeing how that part
part of it works. And uh, come around 2000, 2008, or 2007, 2008, um, a familiar name to me, someone who I've kind of been partial to since the late 80s, decided to make a run for president. It was Dr. Ron Paul. And I got involved. There was a lot of little meetup groups starting to spring up around me. And I said, boy, I'm going to go to one of these little house meetings and see how that goes. And I kind of liked the camaraderie. And what a learning experience that was. For those of you that uh, want to think back to the 2007-2008 campaign, a lot of what Ron Paul's people did it was an enormous teaching effort. I mean, he was legitimately running for president. But he wanted his followers not just to be followers, he wanted his followers to be leaders. He wanted them to understand the political environment around them. So I learned what it was to be a delegate, how to become a delegate. I learned what canvassing and wearing out your shoes was all about. Hours of phone calls. Well, I decided, you know, the RTCs in the state have been eviscerated. There's not much left there. You see, they, they don't want uh, an RTC in every town. That's too many RTCs to be controlled from the top down, you see. You have too many free thinkers out there. So as I realized, I looked across 351 towns in Massachusetts, and not even 50% of them had representation at the Republican level. I realized we have some problems. I revived my RTC. But it, it was defunct. Nothing there in my town for representation. And uh, I just took those steps. Found myself at the caucus and stood up there and I, I said, I'm a, a Romney delegate and I gave the best Ron Paul speech that I could. <laughs> I wound up getting the second highest number of votes. I was beating state representatives and state committee people and senators and all these people were falling by the wayside. And all of this grassroots energy in that room, uh, I can remember walking in there that morning. I was one of the first ones there. I was excited and nervous, and I just didn't know what to do. Um, I showed up, and as people were coming in, I'm listening to the establishment going, oh, this is going to be a great caucus. Oh, another 15 minutes go by. We haven't had this many people in years. And oh my god, this is the biggest group we've ever had. And I'm like, why? I mean, me and a little group of people got around, we said we want to run, and we made phone calls and said, come on out, be involved. We thought we were just doing something running the mill, and routine happened all the time. The establishment didn't think so, they couldn't generate that excitement if they tried. They can't buy that excitement to this day. Well, you know, I made my rounds, I shook hands with everybody, and I talked to young, I talked to the old, and yeah, again, there was no script. I told them what was on my mind. And I listened to what was on their mind. But when I got up to the mic and gave my speech, I said, this is who I am, and this is the message I'm bringing to the, to the convention. I'm a Romney delegate, and I am going to go there to make him the best candidate that I can. And it, it, that would certainly mean swaying him on some things to be more palatable. But I had a message. I was honest with the caucus goers that that was the message I was bringing to the convention. And they elected me. Well, my national or uh, state committee man was not all that thrilled. He tried to uh, get me to not even run and get up there and make my speech because they knew we were coming. They just didn't know how many, from where, and who they were going to be. But we showed up that day, and the nomination process took place. And he tried his darndest when he figured out that I was going to be one of the delegates and said, "You know, we got to unite." We're going to unite as a party and get around the main candidate here. And, you know, you would really be collecting some political capital. Boy, I, I could barf in my pocket every time. <laughs> so, hey, I reminded him, I don't need none of that, no thank you. I said, I'm going to get up and give the best speech I can. I would hope I'd have your support. Well, this uh, state committee man, uh, a self-proclaimed progressive Republican, you know, Modern guy. Valzola? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Um, it, he, uh, he said, you, you got to give a little. It's going to be some compromise. We can't be so rigid in our ideals. And I, I said, well, I disagree. I feel strongly about those things. My three issues are life, liberty, and property. 
And I said, I'm not going up here to compromise on those things. I think the caucus goers, you know, I, I'm going to give them that as my message and let them decide. If they want more of the same, let them vote for it. If they want someone with a message and committed to it, well, they'll have me to vote for it. Well, he said, he was pretty angry. I didn't back down. I went up. They're counting the votes. And he comes up to me just as angry as could be. And he says, you know what? People like you, you come up here and you get angry and you spout out for two weeks and you disappear. And he said, you don't do anything for the party. And I said, well, I don't know why you think you got my uh, politics pigeonholed so well, but you, you seem to know what you're talking about. Well, about a month and a half later, he was resigning from the state committee. I was the chair of my RTC. I bumped into this little group called the, uh -oh, three minutes, <laughs> the Republican Assembly. And I went and checked these folks out because I want to see, you know, are, is this just another wing of the Republican Party? Because there's a lot of those out there, these regional Republican groups, you know. And it, my first uh, thought that that's exactly what it was. And I got to know some of the folks involved, and I realized they are a group of reformers. They're all about reform. So I, I got involved with them. You're my state committee man. He's fading away into nowhere. And things didn't go well for him. He's not much of a fighter, I guess. Well, you know, it, they challenged me within 24 hours. They challenged a whole bunch of us that won. About one-third of the state's delegation were no-namers, people that weren't part of the establishment and weren't loving water for the establishment. And uh, every single one of us got challenged. One. There was only one that didn't make it to the convention that time, and he legitimately missed uh, the registration date. You know, and we were a group of principled people. We believe in going by the rules, and that person rightfully didn't go, and, and we, we concurred with that message. But what was shockingly obvious is that you can't be a newcomer and you can't be a part of the grassroots, follow the rules, get elected, want to be involved, and then think they're going to welcome you. That was not going to happen. And, you know, it, it seemed that the more they did that, the more resolve started to build inside of me. And that is exactly what we need and every single activist is surrounding campaigns like Karen Anderson's and Mr. Fisher's. We need to keep these people involved. Get that fire in their belly. And let me tell you, don't think you're ever going to go into their political pig pen and have them not try to cheat you out of something. Because they don't have the energy. They don't have the message. They've got to fall back on something. And it's going to be every dirty little trick they can to keep your voice minimized. And for them, you should take that. When, when they cheat you out of something, you wear that as, as a badge of honor. You've made them go to an extreme that no party official should. You've exposed them. Only relentless pressure is going to do that. In any one of these battles, you're going to hear an awful lot this evening from different people who have uh, had it tucked to them in a number of different ways. And it's by sticking in there, believe me, there's nothing they like better than to have someone go, oh, I can't believe this, I followed the rules, and he cheated on me, okay, I'm on, on and roll and take that GOP. They go home and they party over that, that's what they want. They want you to quit and unroll. You're now outside of the political system, you're not part of the party system anymore. So. My take-home message to anyone in this room who is angry, feeling disenfranchised, feeling like uh, they don't have support, number one, know that you have support. Number two, the most in-your-face worst thing that you can do to a corrupted party is to stick in there and not leave. I'm asking you to join me. Stand with me. I, I'm not, if you don't want to join Mary, you don't have to. You have to stand for the principles. I'm up here today to talk about principled politics. There's going to be a reform of the state GOP. I'm hoping every person in this room is going to join me in that effort. Reform is coming. And before 2016, this is my promise, before 2016, we're going to be in a position to take that state committee. We are six <laughs> Thank you.
do finish with this is that that moment that I got elected as a delegate started a whole new uh, path for me. I knew that one little nobody, one little country bumpkin can jump into their pig pen and raise holy heck with these guys. So every single one of you, I expect something from you. I expect you to fight. We need it, and we, it starts today. Reform starts today. Thank you.